Promotional consideration paid for by the following. This classic pay-per-view review is sponsored in part by 80's Mania Wrestling Returns, the collectible wrestling card game that fits into the palm of your hand. Collect hundreds of cards for wrestlers, match types, arenas, and more, then book your own totally tubular shows that are rife with 80's and early 90's nostalgia. Just rife with it! If you want a radical manager in your deck, download the game using the link in the description and play through the tutorial, enter the cheat code REGRET, and you'll instantly unlock the Ryan Regret card. 80's Mania Wrestling Returns is the official sponsor for my 80's and early 90's themed classic pay-per-view reviews. Download it today for your Android or iOS device absolutely free. And now enjoy my review of WCW Super Brawl 1. Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. Well, this week is the maiden voyage of the classic segment officially happening every other Thursday here on the channel, so I figured it was appropriate to cover something that was also a first in wrestling. How about the first ever WCW Super Brawl from the Bayfront Arena in St. Petersburg, Florida on May 19th, 1991, but don't tell that to Kane. This show was nominated by Todd Harris on Patreon. Todd, thank you you so much for nominating this show. Like I said, this is the inaugural Super Brawl in WCW's history. They keep this show going until the company's demise. This show featured a lot of good, a fair amount of bad and silly, and also ended up being Ric Flair's last real moment on top of the company for several years, but that's a story for a little bit later in this review. And I know we're not doing these classic reviews on Saturdays anymore, but I just had to show this clip. Super Saturday? What is it? I don't even know what it's called. What is it called? S Super Brawl Saturday. Super Brawl Saturday? Quick question as I observe the thumbnail the network uses for this show as well as the opening graphic package they have here. Why do they use the old Imperial Japanese flag that was retired in 1945 after World War II was over? Seems kind of weird. I know that, you know, visually that flag is a lot more interesting than the current Japanese flag. And I get the idea that in the storyline they have for the main event, it's, oh, those evil Japanese guys are going to try and steal our world championship so they're bad. But it's just weird. You couldn't use just the actual normal normal Japanese flag. 6,000 people in attendance in St. Petersburg on that night. The show garnered a 1.04 buy rate. Jim Ross and Death the Road that it are on commentary at ringside. Your opening contest for the vacant U.S. Tag Team Championships as the fabulous Freebirds, Michael Hayes and Jimmy Jam Garvin, who are accompanied by Diamond Dallas Page on a headset mic and Big Daddy Dink, aka Oliver Humperdink, take on the Young Pistols, that's Steve Armstrong and Tracy Smothers. These two teams had been feuding for a while up to this point and they would keep fighting as the months went on, but at this point they're fighting for those vacant U.S. tag titles. The Steiner brothers were the U.S. tag champs, and back in March they won the World Tag Team Championships, and so they had to vacate the lesser tag belts, which is why these two top contending teams are fighting for the vacant belts. Early in the match, the Freebirds get Steve on the outside, they whip him into the steps, but uh, Steve stops himself, takes out Ding with a clothesline, then hits Michael and Jimmy Jam. Big Daddy Ding trips up Steve soon after, and that brings out Brad Armstrong, the older brother of of Steve of the Young Pistols. Uh, he's getting ready to fight even the odds. The referee ejects both Brad and Big Daddy Dink and the heels are pissed. All I was thinking was where the hell DDP go? He was there at the entrance. I didn't notice he even left and well, what happened? Anyway, great uh, tag team offense and great quickness by the Pistols here. Hayes leapfrogs over Tracy Smothers which causes Tracy to just take his own bump and fly over the top rope despite not even being touched. That is some amazing momentum. That's straight up Lucha Libre shit right there. The Freebirds take their liberties with Smothers on the outside. Side. Hayes and Garvin take their turns getting heat on Tracy until Smothers hits a super kick with onto Garvin. Hot tag to Steve. We're about to get a double missile drop kick from the pistols here, but both the free birds give him the nope treatment. Tracy then hits a double cross by the camera, almost misses. Steve with one of his own on the outside. The pistols hit their double team finish onto Michael Hayes, who is the legal man, but instead of covering him right away, they decide to hit Jimmy Jam with the move as well. And when they hit uh, Jimmy Jam with it, the referee's caught in the crossfire. He's taken out within the first match tonight we get a referee bump it's crazy then all of a sudden out of nowhere was it some kind of bird species of bird that doesn't exist anymore it's fantasia the Freebirds for weeks have been alluding to a third member joining their ranks and this is what they're talking about fantasia the bird apparently he's the bird man he uh, beats up the young pistols and he helps the Freebirds win the match and become the new u.s tag team champions i'm gonna give this one two and a half stars i think it was a really exciting opening matchup great tag team wrestling
wrestling. Great story being told with a very interesting finish. Turns out that Fantasia, first of all, they changed the name from Fantasia to Bad Street in order to avoid legal issues with Disney, but the man under the mask happened to be Brad Armstrong, the very man we saw earlier in the match try and stick up for the Young Pistols. He ran to the back, got into his gimmick with feathers and all, and then he helped out the, uh, the Freebirds win the match. And they never made any kind of allusion to the fact that he was Brad under there. They made him as two separate people, but very interesting that Brad was there twice in a single match, both to help out the Pistols and help out the Freebirds. Up next, Ricky Morton taking on Dangerous Danny Spivey. Morton, of course, one half of the Rock and Roll Express. However, he's been a singles guy for the last couple of months after Robert Gibson hurt his knee. Meanwhile, Spivey is just a few months back in the company. He was gone for the bulk of 1990 from WCW. He left the company over a pay dispute and also having some heat with the Road Warriors at the time. But he's back here. It's a pretty cut and dry squash match. You know, The match begins with Morton full of vim and vigor, but Spivey cuts him off with a DDT. Lots of big power moves by Spivey. Here, the future Waylon Mercy. Uh, we get a bit of a hope spot when Ricky tries to roll up Spivey, but Danny kicks out. We get a bit of a botch here when Ricky comes off the ropes, and there's supposed to be something happening here, but there's kind of like bump into each other. Spivey recovers with a power bomb, foot on the chest to pin, and Morton, of course, has got to look strong in defeat, so he kind of gets that shoulder up just as the referee counts three. So he looks strong in defeat, I guess. I'm going to give this one half a star out of four. You know, like I said, pretty cut and dry squash match. Uh, you know, executed pretty well until the very end. Not a whole lot of meat on the bones beyond that. But things would get interesting for Ricky uh, the next month because Ricky Morton would turn his back on the returning Robert Gibson to join the York Foundation, changing his name to Richard Morton. You can hear about that match and a lot of other things that this show is planting seeds for in my Great American Bash 91 review, which I'll put right here in the corner of your screen. We go to the ramp where Tony Schiavone is with the Z-Man, Tom Zank and Missy Hyatt. The story with Missy is she's been trying to become a backstage interviewer, so she wants to be the first woman to get an interview in the locker room with the men and everything. So uh, they show a clip from Wrestle War back in February where she tried it and she was cut off by Stan Hansen, you yelled at by him. And so Missy, uh, apparently there was a fan poll that asked, should Missy go back to the dressing room and try and get another interview? And so it was two to one in favor of her saying, yes, she should go back and interview some wrestlers. And we'll see where that goes later in the show. Our next match is Tommy Rich, a former NWA World's Champion, taking on Nikita Koloff. Also, Rich would become a future York Foundation member, but he wasn't Thomas Rich just yet. Uh, Koloff is fresh off his stint in Herb Abrams' UWF. He returned to WCW in February at Wrestle War and began a feud with Lex Luger over his United States Championship. It's just a match of size versus speed here, very similar to the last match in a lot of respect. Koloff works Rich in the corner, but Rich fires back, hits Nikita Nikita with a big elbow, but he goes for it again and misses it. Dusty sounds like an auctioneer at one point in commentary. He went to the well one time, the first time he got away with it. You know what I mean? The devil made me do it the first time, second time I've done it on my own. It does not always work. Rich regains the advantage with some corner punches, goes for a crossbody off the ropes, but Koloff ducks, Russian sickle, and Koloff wins the match. I'm going to give this one one star out of four. This match had a little more fire than the previous squash match, which I guess is appropriate given Tommy Rich's nickname. Uh, but, you know, it was still very similar to the big heel guy won. Tony Schiavone's back on the ramp, and he's interviewing a debuting Johnny B. Bad, who's accompanied by his manager, Theodore Long. The two cut a promo on PN News right off the bat, so I guess he's the first victim of Johnny B. Bad here before they walk up the ramp. This is actually Mark Merrill's first appearance as Johnny B. Bad, but he had previously shown up in WCW as a job guy for Sid Vicious, literally like a week, uh, two weeks or so, maybe two and a half weeks before this show. As Mark Merrow, then he's gone for a couple weeks, comes back as Johnny B. Bad. What a huge turnaround. Up next, the natural Dustin Rhodes takes on Terrence Taylor, who's accompanied by Alexandra York, Mr. Hughes, and the newly elected board of directors for the York Foundation for the first quarter of 1991. Just four dudes in suits on stage with them as they make their way to the ring. I love this gimmick of Terry Taylor, the computerized man of the 1990s. And I say that without a shred of irony. It is like such a great gimmick for the time. Yeah, looking back now, it's cheesy to think of like someone punching numbers into a supercomputer that will you know, strategize and map out how to win a wrestling match. But back then, how many average people knew what computers were capable of? So it's like, yeah, maybe it's feasible, but it's still very, it's just an out there gimmick, but it's like, it's so good with the times when like computers were, personal computers were still kind of a relatively new thing. And so I just think it was great. Dustin Rhodes is undefeated in WCW since debuting earlier in the year. He has refused an invitation to join the York Foundation, which was prompted this match here tonight. I do find it kind of ironic that 
that Rose was feuding with a stable that was led by a woman who would eventually become his wife and the mother of his child. Funny how wrestling works sometimes. Terry Taylor powders out of the ring early on to check what the computer says. He does this a lot. Like, the bulk of the first part of the match is him just like going outside and conferring with Alexandra York, who's looking at her computer. I would have killed to know what kind of banter those two would have had about the computer when they're on the outside. Like, uh, you know, uh, computations, uh, algorithms, vectors. We get some wrestling between the two. Dustin works the arm, but Taylor gets the ropes, powders again. Like I said, a lot of the match here, the first part of it at least, is all Taylor powdering out of the ring. Taylor goes for a suplex, but Rhodes reverses it. He goes for a cross body, but Taylor ducks and Rhodes rolls out to the ring. Taylor guillotines him on the top rope off the ramp, then suplexes him back into the ring, using the bottom rope as kind of a, a platform to bounce off of. Dusty on commentary says Taylor's taking the breather, which according to him was designed by the computer. Taylor goes for an axe handle, but Dustin puts up the boot. Big comeback, including the clothesline that sees Taylor practically land inside out. Rhodes hits the bulldog. It's going for the win, but Alexandra York gets on the apron with the distraction. Taylor and Hughes now working together in tandem. Hughes puts on the black glove and goes to punch Dustin's lights out, but Dustin ducks, so Hughes hits Taylor instead. Rhodes goes for the cover, wins, and pieces on out of there. I give this one two stars out of four. The match started out kind of really slow, but then, you know, by the end, it got very interesting. And the story of Dustin fighting the odds here, not just Taylor, but also Alexandra York and Mr. Hughes near the end, made for an exciting finish. In our next match, Black Bart takes on Big Josh, who's accompanied by bears! Bears walking on their hind legs. Holy shit, what does a lumberjack need with bears at his disposal? Uh, of course, Big Josh is uh, also known as Matt Bourne, also known as the first Doin' the Clown a few years after this. Matt's been on this classic review segment a few different times in a few different incarnations, let's just say. The match is pretty much a big brawl, scrappy the entire time. It's punches, it's eye rakes, it's a fight. Black Bart goes for some clotheslines near the end, but Josh keeps taking him down with like single arm takedowns. It's kind of a cool counter. He hits an axe handle followed by a big butt drop to win. That's Dusty and uh, what well, Dusty and JR call it. Now, that's their words, not mine. I give it one star to four. It was a big, ugly brawl, but the real stars of this match were the Bears. And then after the match, the best part is there's no music playing. Josh just wins the match. He just looks at the camera and goes, okay, I'm gonna go now. Bye. It just looks so awkward. Josh doesn't know what to do with himself after he wins the match and the crowd doesn't know either. We get a special edition of the Danger Zone, hosted by Paul E. Dangerously. Dangerously sporting a cowboy hat in honor of his guest here, Stan Hansen, whose face is about 70% chew. Hansen calls out Dustin Rhodes. I guess he just missed the fact that Dustin literally just wrestled like five minutes earlier. And so then Hansen leaves. Heyman yells some more into the camera. His mic stops working and he walks off. That was the segment, that was the bit. And so, all right, that's interesting stuff. Oh my folks, I am so excited to tell you about this next segment. The match is Oz versus Tim Parker. Who cares what Tim Parker is? Let's talk about Oz though. First off, before the entrance begins, you hear someone on the mic go, Tell me when. So then we see Dorothy, the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Cowardly Lion make their way to the ramp, being led by Kevin Sullivan in a mask. He's the wizard. He's got a monkey on his shoulder. He just keeps saying, welcome to Oz, welcome to Oz, welcome to Oz. The fans are booing the shit out of this, and it's just wonderful. Uh, Oz finally appears on stage. It's Kevin Nash in a big robe and mask. He was the Master Blaster literally a week before this, and now he is Oz. And you hear his voice on the loudspeaker saying, I will show you who I truly am. Like, Kevin Nash's voice is just not intimidating. It's a cool voice, I like his voice, but it's not fear-inducing. Whatever vibe they're going for with Oz here, Kevin Nash's voice just does not fit it. So anyway, he scares off the cast of the Wizard of Oz. Sullivan keeps saying, welcome to Oz, welcome to Oz, as he struggles with the monkey, like, hopping off the, on the ground and back onto his shoulder. This is just amazing. Uh, Oz manhandles the jobber. His finisher is this big, like, spinning backdrop kind of thing. I guess it's supposed to be reminiscent of, like, the twister element from the movie. And to him, Oh no, it's a twister, it's a twister. Oz wins the match. I give this one four fucking stars. You heard me. This was incredible and don't bother to argue with me on this one. Picking up where we left off with Missy Hyatt, we see her backstage in the dressing room trying to interview somebody. She gets a word with Terry Taylor and then wants to go into the shower, see if the Z-Man's in there. But instead, it's old Stan Hansen in his underwear. He still has a bunch of chew in his mouth. And he yells at Missy again. Oh, poor Missy. Not again. Womp womp. 
Up next is the taped fist match as Flyin' Brian Pillman takes on Barry Windham. It's a grudge match between these two. These guys have been feuding for a while to this point. The whole gimmick is their fists are heavily taped, which allows them to hit harder without hurting their hands. Uh, Pillman gets a hot start. Windham cuts him off. Barry goes to the top rope, but Pillman hits him with a drop kick. Windham falls to the outside. Pillman dives to the outside with a fist. Great opening salvo for Pillman here. Windham's bleeding. He pulls Pillman into the ring post, though. Back at the ramp area, Windham drops Pillman face first onto the guardrail. Both men are now just bleeding profusely as the match goes on. We're just getting a back and forth war between these two. It's a really, really captivating stuff here. Pillman with some loud chops to Barry's chest. Barry hits the ropes and both men knock noggins on the rebound. Pillman goes to the top rope. Wyndham shoves the ref out of the way so he can hit a huge low blow into Pillman. Superplex, the best superplex in the business. Barry Wyndham wins the match dirty. Uh, I'm going to give it two and a half stars. Very fast paced match with a lot of action crammed in. These two would keep on fighting, leading to a loser leaves WCW match later, which Pillman would lose, but he would come back literally like weeks later as the yellow dog under a mask. And the whole thing was, oh, no one can prove it's Brian Pillman. We get a lot of live mic issues with DDP as he's on stage getting ready for his talk show segment, The Diamond Mine. Let's now go. Please shut up. To The Diamond Mine. Shut up, everyone. Please, please, please. Are we live? That's right, you got Diamond Dallas Page here! DDP tosses to a pre-taped interview featuring Sting and Lex Luger talking about their tag title match later in the night. And then Page introduces his newest client, the Diamond Stud, better known today as Scott Hall. This is his new big character that he debuts on this night. And uh, DDP says they're looking for a new studette to be Scott's valet. And that's pretty much all this segment was. DDP tossing to a Sting and Lex Luger package and then bringing out Scott Hall. And that was pretty much it. Uh, you know, it's just crazy to see how many people you see here on this show who are like either debuting like entirely or just debuting a new character who would all be like pivotal roles uh, in wrestling in the future like Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, Mark Mara, all these guys you're seeing in the for the first time with these incarnations and it's crazy to think how much they would go on to just shape the business in like the mid to late 90s and beyond. Sid Vicious takes on Eligante in a Battle of the Giants up next. This match is also billed as a stretcher match. It's important to know that for later. Uh, Sid tries to assert his place in the match, but he gets hit with a bad-looking clothesline. He powders, gets back in the ring. He apparently hits uh, Eligante with a low blow. JR calls it that, but you can't really tell. He goes for a corner attack, but Eligante stops him, puts him in the claw hold, shoulders on the mat, referee counts to three, and wait a minute, I thought this was a stretcher match. The whole point of this match was to put your opponent on the stretcher and roll him out of the ring. Ring. That's not what we get here. Just a pinfall. Okie doke. Out come the one man gang and Kevin Sullivan, fresh off his stint as the wizard, to beat up Eligante while Sid makes his way to the back. You can actually hear some fans chanting, hey, hey, goodbye at Sid because this was Sid's final match in WCW for a while. We wouldn't be seeing him in the company for several years after this point. Uh, but yeah, so gang and Sullivan beat up Eligante for a bit until he finally like, you know, wakes up and, and chases them off. We'll see uh, Eligante and one man gang fight at Great American bash and you just gotta watch my review to see what i thought about that match but this one i'm gonna give zero stars because it was short it was bad and the finish went against what they were advertising with a stretcher match so what happened Time for the Thunder Doom Cage match as Ron Simmons takes on Butch Reed. The story here is, of course, these two were part of the tag team known as Doom. They lost the tag titles in February and they broke up with Teddy Long, their manager, siding with Butch Reed. Ron Simmons becoming a face in the process. And throughout the weeks and months, you know, uh, Reed and uh, Long were working together. They were cheating to win their matches. So this one here is in a cage and Theodore Long's in his own little shark cage suspended above the ring. And we all know that's a shark surefire way to keep any interference from happening from the guy in the shark cage. Uh, Simmons starts out strong, but he eats the steel cage when Reed ducks the shoulder tackle. Reed uses the cage as a weapon. Ron begins to fire back, but Reed pulls him into the cage again, cutting him off. It's all Reed for the bulk of this match. Every time Simmons tries to mount a comeback, Reed cuts him off. We get a big shoulder tackle off the top rope by Butch Reed. Simmons is saved by a foot on the ropes, which I thought wouldn't count in a cage match, but okay. We get a double down. At that point, Long throws a chain into the ring from his miniature cage, proving once again the stipulation 
simulation has never worked in doing what it's entirely designed to do. And with uh, Simmons and Reed fight for the chain, Reed gets it first. He goes for a chain attack, but Simmons ducks, hits him with the uh, spine buster to win the match. So Simmons wins the day here, and now it's kind of it's the maiden voyage on his big, you know, burgeoning singles career, where he we would eventually, much later, become the world champion. But this is kind of the beginning of that. I'm gonna give this one three stars out of four. I really enjoyed this match. It was hard hitting. It was physical. I, I, I've said it before in this review, and I'll say it again. I love the story here in this matchup. The way that Simmons is keep trying to fight back, and Reed keeps cutting them off, and he eventually gets the breaks needed to uh, eventually defeat his former tag team partner. This is good stuff. Up next, World Tag Championship match as the Steiner brothers defend against their friends and training partners, Sting and the U.S. champion Lex Luger. It's a big face versus face matchup here, uh, as it's also reflected in the very sappy opening video package before the match begins. Now, here's the recent history of the tag titles. Try and follow me on this one. At Wrestle War in February, the fabulous Freebirds beat Doom to become the new tag team champions. In March, the Steiners beat the Freebirds to win the belts. However, that match was taped back in February, six days before Wrestle War. So technically, the Freebirds lost the belts before they won them. And if you actually kind of look at it, uh, Wikipedia, the way they list this, is that the uh, tag team reign for the Freebirds there is technically negative six days long, which is just absolutely insane. But that's what happens when you run live events parallel to taped events and title changes like that happen before the thing. It, I, my mind was blown when I read that. The match begins with Rick and Lex in the ring. Rick's able to out-wrestle Luger early on and bring the power with a German suplex and a Steiner line. Luger comes right back with a huge clothes on that turns Rick inside out, followed by a military press. Sting comes into the rings at House of Fire. He misses the splash in the corner. Scott's tagged in. He's got his time to shine. Luger and Scott are working together now. Luger with a power slam goes for the torture rack, but Scott counters with a Russian leg sweep. There's a lot of these big impact, high impact moves from all four guys here in this match. Matchup, and it's like I'm, I'm giving you the very, very abridged Cliff Notes version here. A Rick with a blind tag. He hits Luger with the Bulldog. He's totally unaware that Rick got tagged in. Sting hits Rick with a missile drop kick from behind. A huge move by Sting. And then there's this kind of like brief moment where everything kind of comes to a halt because Sting's like, oh, wait. I don't know if he was saying that there was a tag. Like JR was trying to say Sting tried to tag in, but that's not true at all because there was, you know, he was nowhere near uh, Lex Luger during any of this exchange. So I think he was trying, I think he, he might have been confused in, in storyline over the blind tag that the Steiners had. I don't know, but it did kind of bring things to a halt for a split second. Anyway, we get back on track. We get a double down between Rick and Lex. Sting and Scott tag in and they're throwing punches. No more of this friendly rivalry crap. It's all just they're throwing hands at this point. Sting reverses a tombstone with one of his own. Luger and Rick are fighting on the outside. The referee's out with them. Out comes Nikita Koloff lurking in the shadows with the chain wrapped around his arm. He's gonna deck Luger with the chain, but Sting pushes Lex out of the way takes the bullet, and so then Scott pins Sting to retain the championships. I'm going to give this one four stars out of four. Even though there was at one point near the end where things kind of like there's the confusion, I don't think it took away too much from the match. I think it was a great match, great story of the face versus face. How are they going to overcome this issue? The finish, I think, was a very smart way of going about it because not only did it help take, it helped protect all uh, four guys, the Steiners don't get any heel heat for retaining, and the uh, Lex and Sting look good in defeat like they didn't get beat you know, legitimately and not only that but it also helps transition like it blends a couple of feuds together between Volkov I'm sorry, I'm sorry Koloff and Luger and uh, then it turns into Koloff and Sting as we see in the post-match fracas between Sting and Koloff on the outside but yeah I think it was a very good match uh, one of the better matches of the show and yeah so they have this big fight in the backstage area between Sting and Koloff and then that's going to lead to a Russian chain match between the two uh, at the Great American Bash. TV championship match in your semi-main as Arn Anderson defends against beautiful Bobby Eaton. Back in 1990, for the first time since 1979, Bobby Eaton became a singles competitor after Jim Cornette and Stan Lane left WCW. The Midnight Express was no more. After a few months, Eaton turned babyface and challenged Anderson for the championship, which brings us to this match. Anderson, by the way, is on his third reign with the TV championship. Uh, the one he had previously was uh, well over a year long, 
this reign here, he's about five months into it. Uh, Eaton has Anderson selling early on with some big punches and knees. They fight in the corner. Eaton makes his way up top and Arn throws him face first onto the ramp. Eaton recovers though with a backdrop onto Arn on the ramp. Another one into the ring, follows it up with an axe handle. Arn with a cheap shot on Bobby, wraps his leg around the ring post. Arn working the leg pretty aggressively for the remainder of this match, but Eaton is able to fight back, driving Anderson face first into each turnbuckle pad in one corner. I think Matt Hardy would make that spot famous years later. Eaton with some big right hands and some tremendous selling by Anderson, like doing some jazz poses. Bam! Uh, Arn goes back to working the leg, but Eaton fights out of it with some kicks. Anderson goes for a splash, but he takes some knees. Arn still recovers, hits the spine buster onto Eaton. Bobby kicks out. Anderson goes for an axe handle. Bobby catches him with another punch and a flip from Arn. Big neck breaker as he goes up for the Alabama jam. Barry Windham shows up looking to interfere, but Flying Brian runs in and uh, runs interference and prevents Windham from doing anything to Eaton. Eaton with a diving leg drop off the top beats Arn Anderson to become the new television champion. Even though it's a relatively short reign in the grand scheme of things, still a landmark victory for Eaton. Really helps legitimize him as a singles guy after years of being stigmatized as just a tag team wrestler. I'm going to give this match three stars out of four. I think it was great technical wrestling on display and just tremendous selling, like I said, by Arn, especially Arn, but also Bobby as well. Um, Bobby made like the pain look so real, legitimate, but Arn's selling of the right hands was just great. That was a big story they told, not just the work with the leg, but also Arn's left versus Bobby's right, as something JR explained and kind of exp did some exposition in the beginning of the match, and they played that really well. Yeah, very entertaining match with a very satisfying finish of Eaton going over clean to become the champion. Main event time for the WCW World Championship. That's a very important distinction, by the way, as Ric Flair defends against Tatsumi Fujinami. Uh, back in March, at the WCW New Japan Super Show in Tokyo at the Egg Dome, the IWGP champion Fujinami beat the NWA champion Ric Flair for the NWA championship, so Tatsumi became a dual champion. However, in America, they were still treating the NWA and WCW titles like two separate championships, so their whole line of reasoning was, oh, Flair lost the match by disqualification, or he won the match by disqualification, something where basically he didn't lose any championships. They kind of negated the whole NWA stuff, and they said Flair was still the WWE champion, and now in this rematch, Flair is looking for revenge and for a American pride or whatever. They're trying to paint, like, the Japanese wrestler as, you know, an evil foreigner trying to take the world championship back to Japan, and, that, and it's weird because Flair is still predominantly a heel at this point in his career and they're painting him as a baby face so in Japan their perspective was it was title for title NWA championship versus WCW championship where WCW just said that's nah, for the WCW title so the NWA that's kind of like they're not really acknowledging it at that point Fujinami comes out with an entourage of geishas Flair comes out flanked by his butler and his cook totally the same thing in fact I'm willing to bet that some of the extras on stage with Flair were also like some of the board members from the York Foundation from earlier in the show we have two referees in this matchup. Tiger Hattori is the uh, primary official in this matchup, whereas Bill Alfonso, representing the good old US of A, is the secondary official in case anything goes awry. That's important to know for later. Flair opens up with some chops, but Fujinami gets Flair tied up in a bow and arrow. Really cool counter by Flair to turn a roll up attempt by Tatsumi into one of his own. Tatsumi works the leg and the back. On the outside, Flair is able to regain the advantage, now works on Fujinami's leg. Figure four applied, but Tatsumi reverses it. Fujinami Fujinami puts Flair in the Scorpion Deathlock, but we get a rope break. Flair throws Tatsumi out of the ring, goes to attack him in the barricade, but it backfires. They make their way back to the ring. Flair's bleeding, as he is wont to do. He's being taken to the limit by Fujinami. He rolls out of the ring and does the Flair flop to show you how exhausted he is. Tatsumi gets the octopus hold on Flair for a long time, but Flair powers out of it. Both men are down, completely spent. The action, you can see, it's like it's the body language. It just looks like they've been totally drained from this matchup here. Uh, very close near fall after a body slam by Flair goes awry. Small package uh, kick out as well. O'Connor roll attempt by F Fujinami. Flair pushes out of it and Tatsumi collides with Tiger Hattori, the referee. Flair grabs the tights and a pin. Bill Alfonso runs in, makes the count, and Flair wins. Bill Alfonso called it right down the middle, daddy! I'm going to give this match four stars out of four. Again, another great match here. And I just love, again, the physicality and the body language and the way they sell just how much exhaustion these two guys go through 
crew in the quest for the championship. And like, they really put themselves through a lot in this matchup here. They don't do anything too crazy, but it is very physical and it's very, just like, it's very intense what they're doing. And I think they show it very well. So that's why I give it the, the top marks in this matchup here. It's another classic, you know, flair victory by way of dirty ways to, to win and stuff. So it's more flair being flair. This would be the pretty much the swan song for flair and WCW for the time being, because less than two months later, flair was gone from the company as the champion. He got into a pay dispute with Jim Hurd, the vice president of the company at the time. He left the company, took the championship belt with him because he believed he physically, he actually owned the legitimate belt because he put a deposit down in order to have the championship. He felt he was owed the money back plus interest. Jim Hurd said no, and Flair went, okay, I'm gonna go to WWF and take the belt with me. And that's what he did. And he did pretty well for himself in his run with the WWF for a time. And that was really, and this happened like a couple of weeks before Great American Bash. And so the story was the match between like he and Luger got kiboshed. They had to put Barry Windham in Flair's place. Fans were chanting, we want Flair. It was a very controversial show in that respect. One of the myriad issues with Great American Bash 1991. But Flair leaving so soon before the show was, what was probably the biggest thing that went wrong with that show. My final grade for WCW's inaugural Super Brawl is a B grade. I think on the whole, it's a very entertaining show. It starts off strong and it ends really strong. I think there are one or two too many filler matches for my liking, like, you know, Morton and Spivey, Rich and Koloff, Black Bart and Big Josh and his Dancing Bears. Then, of course, there's the god-awful stretcher match between Sid and Eligante. But other than that, I think everything else on the card is really strong. I love the opening match for the U.S. Tag Titles with the Freebirds and the Young Pistols. Welcome to Oz! Welcome to Oz! Love that stuff. Like, even though we all know the gimmick was crap, I could not help but smile and laugh my ass off over the entire, from beginning to end, that whole segment was just entertainment. Just, oh, I want to bottle that entertainment there. Simmons versus Reed, the uh, cage match was really fun to watch. The World Tag Title match, the TV title match, the WCW and or NWA Championship match with Flair and Fujinami. All great stuff. There's a lot of good to be seen in this first Super Brawl. And if you haven't seen the show before, I recommend you check it out. It's on the network. What's so tragic is how good this show is on the whole and how bad Great American Bash 91 is just a couple of months later. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of Super Brawl 91. Thanks once again to Todd Harris on Patreon for nominating the show. I had a great time watching it. If you want to play a role in determining which classic shows I review, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to pick classic shows for me to review in the future. Next time on the classic review segment, we're going to look and see what happens when one of the most influential groups in wrestling history gets their own pay-per-view. Spoiler alert, it flops miserably. We're looking at NWO sold out 1997. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. Super Bowl Saturday?